Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Welcome to the 2019 graduation ceremony of the ALU School of Business MBA program. My name is Maulam Esel Kumsen, and I will be your host for today. The ceremony will begin shortly. May I request that you now turn your phones to silent and you take your seats. We now welcome the august faculty of the ALU School of Business from Nigeria to Sierra Leone to the United States of America, from Ghana to Rwanda and Somalia. These amazing men and women are a representation of all the illustrious citizens of the continent and beyond who have given of their time to nurture and guide our students on this journey. They have spent hours preparing lessons and even more hours in the classroom, online and on grading, hours debating and refining the arguments of our graduates. They have been the people who have told them stories of Africa and of business and of leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving this faculty team a resounding round of applause. Come on, we can do it better. A big round of applause for the faculty of ALUSD. We now welcome the MBA class of 2019 of the ALU School of Business. They are on the cusp of moving from graduates to graduates, from students to alumni. They are incredible professionals from 15 countries. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the graduating class of the ALU School of Business. Let us welcome them with a rousing round of applause, befitting of this auspicious occasion. I wanna be rich, I wanna be famous, I wanna have lots and lots of money. Sorry about the clouds, I wanna be free. Like Nelson Mandela Stand tall like a pyramid So, so courageous 
outrageous No place I'd rather be There's no place I'd rather be Live and die in Africa MBA class of 2019, may I ask that we remain standing as we will begin the program today with a national anthem, followed by an opening prayer that will be led by Bishop John Rushahana. The national anthem is on your program behind the agenda. We will sing the first stanza and we will have a member of the dance troupe to lead us. Rwanda nziza jihugu chatu Uji miso zivi aga nivirunga Ngobji duye tsega hora nisha Reka tukura te tukufugi vigui O utubumbi e hamlet kwe sabanyarwa nduko atubyaye verwa sugira singizwite ka kombezi mi gorwanda dukunda Dua guru chire kukwita njira Gwa maora sabe muba gutu huye Wishire wiza ne muribjo se Urangwe nisha kuteri mbere Uamnyu muba no na manga Let us pray <clears throat> with the hope that this prayer is not just a ceremonial, it's a groan of our hearts to pray for the sustainability of the vision for the funding of this school, which lives to prove Pan-African existence, to meet the needs of Africa the nature and the quality of service and the development of Africa. Also pray for those who graduate to live up to the vision of the finding of the school. Let us pray. Dear loving Lord and Father, we thank you and give you glory for who you are. And we thank you for making it possible for us to be who we are, Africans. We thank you for this vision. We pray with all the sincerity of our hearts that the purpose, the vision of the school come to live through those who graduate through it and from it, that they may live to transform Africa. They may live to give the joy and the dignity 
of who you intended them to be. Lord, we pray that those who graduate may continue to live not only as business people for themselves, but to live for others and for the development of the generations after them. We pray, Lord, that Africa may have the sense to receive their service to them, that the embracing of their love and their service, their commitment, may be a true witness to our future and our destiny. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May we now take our seats. Dr. Fred Swanaker, founder and CEO of the African Leadership Group. Honorable Dr. Eugene Mitimura, Minister of Education. Honorable Rosemary Mbabazi, Minister of Youth. Honorable Francis Gattari, Cabinet Minister. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Donald Kabaruka. Professor Jeffrey Rujeje, Vice Chancellor, African Leadership University. Mr. Faustin Imbundu, Chairman of the Board of Directors, African Leadership University. Our esteemed dignitaries, guests, family and friends, members of the class of 2019, Ikaze, Akwaba, Karibu, a warm African welcome to the land of a thousand hills. On the 1st of July, 2017, a group of middle-aged professionals gathered for the first time on the lawn of our keynote speaker, Dr. Donald Kabaruka's residence. As they overlooked the city and the lights of a thousand hills, they listened intently as Alana Finley, their senior, told them, this ish is hard, excuse my French. They had traveled from as far afield as Mauritius, the United Kingdom, Central African Republic, and Lesotho to embark on this journey. They are to be only the second class so far of graduates of the ALU School of Business MBA program. The ALU SB MBA is the first Pan-African program of its kind, bringing together students from across the continent and beyond who aspire to lead change and catalyze the prosperity of Africa. We are Africa's MBA, and we are preparing leaders like these for the African century. Today, 18 months later, we are back in Kigali to celebrate this amazing group of change makers. And as we celebrate them, we do so in a truly Rwandan way with a dance, the Amaraba a victory dance performed after battle to celebrate the warriors. And today, we celebrate these warriors. Please join me in welcoming the internationally acclaimed dance troupe in, Gun in Ganzo Ingari. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, the sound of victory is thunderous. Well done, MBA class of 2019. And now, for the opening remarks, it is my distinct privilege to introduce the chairman and CEO of the African Leadership Group and the founder of the African Leadership University. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Fred Swanaker. Honorable Dr. Eugene Mutimira, Minister of Education. Honorable Rosemary Mbabazi, Minister of Youth. Honorable Francis Gattare, Cabinet Minister, our keynote speaker. Dr. Donald Kabaruka, Professor Jeffrey Ujeje, Vice Chancellor, African Leadership University. Mr. Forsted Mbundu, Chairman of the Board of Directors of African Leadership University. Our esteemed dignitaries, guests, families, and friends. And most of all, members of the class MBA class of 2019. Let me add um, my warm words of welcome to everyone to this uh, wonderful day. And uh, please join me in congratulating our class, uh, the MBA class of 2019, for this wonderful achievement of today. I also would like to thank all those who have gone on this journey over the last two years with uh, our MBA graduates. Uh, when I did my MBA at Stanford about 15 years ago, I was single, I did not have a job, and um, I didn't have any children. So I could focus on my program for two years. The ladies and gentlemen who are about to graduate here have all been doing this MBA, a very rigorous MBA program, with wives and husbands and children and jobs and so many responsibilities to juggle. And so I have huge admiration for them. Um, and most importantly, for all of you, the families who have had patience with them over the two years while they have been going through this. So please, let's, let's thank all the families and friends who have been supporting them. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize and thank some of our special corporate partners. Um, we have uh, Tembi and M. Tamsin from uh, Standard Bank who have been on this journey with us as well, helping to ensure that we develop some great leaders for their, for their organization. Now, here at the African Leadership University School of Business, we talk about developing leaders for the African century. Now, why do we talk about the African century? One of the things we believe is that for if we look back to the last thousand years, the millennia that has just ended, the first seven year, 700 years was defined by what happened in Europe, North America, you know, when the, the Renaissance period happened and lots of scientific innovations emerged and the Industrial Revolution happened and a lot of progress in the world was driven by what happened in those economies. And then when you look at 100 years ago, the last century, a lot of the progress that we saw in the world was defined by what happened in Asia. That's when we saw the rise of countries like Japan and Malaysia and Singapore and more recently, China and India and so forth. And that really defined where the world went. Now, when we look at the century that we're in, the 21st century, we believe that the world will be defined by what happens in Africa. 
And this is because by the end of the century, 40% of the world's population will be African. And so where Africa goes is where the world will go. And even more interesting is that by 2035, which is less than 6,000 days from today, Africa will have the largest workforce in the world. One billion people who will be of working age on this continent, the largest, larger than China, larger than India. And so this is why we believe that this is going to be the African century. The only question is, will it be a good century or a bad century? And we believe that only by applying our greatest resource, which is not the gold and the diamonds and the oil that we have, but our minds and our people, will we ensure that this becomes a great century for the entire world. And so this is really the vision behind the African Leadership University, to develop three million leaders, entrepreneurs, innovators, who are going to apply their minds with passion and with ingenuity to address Africa's greatest challenges and capture its greatest opportunities. People who are going to make sure that every African in this century has good health care, good education, good infrastructure, good governance, and most importantly, jobs. One of the things that we talked about yesterday was that um, as the, well, I spoke with the, the, this graduating class yesterday and I reminded them of three things. The first thing that I said was that as they go through this journey, as they move on uh, from uh, the, the, the two years that they've been with us here, they're going to need perseverance because the job of leadership is hard. And so at the African Leadership University, when you go to any campus, you'll see the first thing you see is are three words, do hard things. And that's a reminder that as they go out into the world, and especially given that they are privileged, very, very few people on this continent have, have had a chance to have primary school education, secondary school education, university education, let alone a graduate degree. As the 1% of the 1%, their job is not to solve small problems. The job is to solve our continent's biggest problems. And in doing that, they're going to face many challenges. They're going to have many ups and downs. What is going to take them through is perseverance. And so what I want to remind you again, class of 2019, as you go through the next 20, 30 years of your career, to support each other and to remember all the friends and family that got you through this, and most importantly, that went through this 20-month program with you. Uh, and also to remember that at ALU, you never really graduate. Today we're having a ceremony, but this is really the beginning of your, of your, your relationship with us. We say that this is like Hotel California. You can enter, but you can never leave. And so we're looking forward to, um, Dr. Karuka just mentioned that it sounds like Brexit. Um, and so we are, we're going to be with you through these ups and downs and, and, and we'll be constantly reminding you when you have those moments of doubt that um, this is what leadership is about. It's about doing those hard things and continuing even when you have obstacles that seem impossible. The second point I reminded them about yesterday when I spoke with them is that we talk about developing three million leaders for Africa, three million leaders who will ensure that the one billion people that, that will need jobs in less than 6,000 days from now will actually be employed and will, be, will have health care and education and all these things that we believe they need. Now, one exercise that I often do with our younger leaders, we have an undergraduate program in Mauritius and Rwanda and we've also got some programs in, in Kenya. Um, I talk to these young leaders and I say, if you divide the, the one billion jobs that will need to be created, by the three million leaders that we're developing, that works out to be 300 jobs per leader. Simple math, doesn't seem impossible. Three million leaders, 300 jobs per leader. We can then ensure that the entire continent is, is employed. And that's the task that we have set for the, 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 the three million leaders we're developing. But the group that is here are not undergraduates. They have 10 to 15 years of work experience. Some of them even have 20 years of work experience. They have been through undergraduate programs already. Some of them have other master's degrees. They work in the most prestigious organizations in Africa. They have brilliant minds. 
And so yesterday we did an exercise where I asked them to think about what their challenge is going to be. If the young leaders are doing 300 jobs, then what are they going to do? We have Clever Mugabe in the class, who's from Rwanda. He has already created 1,000 jobs. And so they did an exercise where they thought about what they would all, um, as, a, as, as a class, be able to do. And it was inspiring to see the numbers that they came up with. We had numbers ranging from 3,000 to 5,000. Those, those were the ones that were in the group with Clever. <laughs> and then, obviously, some you know, had other numbers. But at the end of the day, the average that came out of this exercise was 1,300 jobs per leader. That's what they thought, that if the young people are doing 300 jobs per leader, then they're saying they're going to do 1,300 on average. So I want all of you in the room to, to witness this and hold them accountable over the next 6,000 days that this, because what I said to them is that if we think about the, the, the fights that, the, 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 that we're going to, we're, we're entering into um, one of the greatest struggles um, that we have ever had as a continent in the next 6,000 days. And in that battle, they are the admirals and the generals that are going through. They're not the foot soldiers, they're not the infantrymen, they're the admirals and the generals. So they need to think big and to be able to have significant impact on the continent. The, the third thing I said is that the expectations are very high. And we're looking forward to you living up to them. But the good news is that here at the ALUSB, they have been prepared well for this task. Because one of the things we believe is that you learn leadership best through practice. It's not a theoretical exercise. And so, while many of them complained and thought about how challenging this, this experience was over the last two years, it was exactly what you needed. Because there's a difference between what you want and what you need. And what you needed was a very rigorous, challenging experience over the last two years where you had to balance so many things. And to come through today, having survived, much stronger and with the muscle to go out and do the much harder things that you're going to have to do. Because this last 20 months was, was, uh, was child's play compared to what you're going to have to do over the next 6,000 days as we, we go out into this battle. So I want to congratulate you again and to, and to, to really um, thank you for being our partners in this journey and uh, in, in creating also a flagship institution for the continent as the second uh, class and also as co-founders really of this university and to wish you well as you go out and serve our beloved continent and to bring peace and prosperity to Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Class of 2019, the expectations are high. Now we move on to the Student Special Awards. These awards celebrate the students who have excelled in our flagship leadership lab and doing business in Africa courses. To present the first award, I would like to welcome Ryan Findlay, the Chief Product Officer of the African Leadership University and outgoing head of the Leadership Lab. I'm a little bit taller than Fred. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> The African Leadership University School of Business takes its name very seriously. The mission of the school is to train the next generation of African leaders, and as such, students spend at least 25% of their program in ALUSB's leadership course, known as the Leadership Lab. <clears throat> the Leadership Lab is a challenging course centered on what we call V3 leadership, a mixture of virtuous action, value creation, and visionary thinking. Virtue, value, and vision. Studying African leaders that most of us have never heard of, students learn many things. They learn to embody the moral fortitude of a Dr. Hawa Abdi, who is the mother of Dr. Deco, who's joining us today, who built an entire community of 50,000 people from nothing, including the only functional hospital in Somalia during the height of the Civil War, all while standing up to warlords and terrorists. Students learn how to practice the creative prowess of a Bethlehem Alemu, who built a global business using mostly recycled tires and unemployed slum dwellers in Ethiopia. Students learn how to cast an inspiring vision, 
like Ibrahim Abulesh, who envisioned a new Eden in the sandy desert of Egypt and made it a win-win for the people, the planet, and the investors who needed a profit. These cases are powerful and instructive. However, in Leadership Lab, it is not enough to merely read, think, and speak about leadership. Leadership is not a series of intellectual exercises. As Fred said, we believe that one must actually practice leadership to grow as a leader. LL, as the students like to call it, calls on students to use their workplaces and their communities and even their homes, some of you can attest to this, as laboratories for trial and error. The Leadership Lab stretches every student to take action and sometimes even risky and unpopular action. And afterwards, after having succeeded or failed, the Leadership Lab provides them with a safe space to reflect on their actions and build on them going forward. So, as you can probably tell, the Leadership Lab is no walk in the park. And so when we honor the recipient of the V3 Leadership Award, we are honoring one of the hardest working students in the entire program. We are also celebrating somebody who did not just write or say the correct things in class, but we are, but we are honoring somebody who significantly grew in his or her leadership abilities throughout the program and demonstrated them for all of us to see. Let me tell you about this person. <clears throat> This student was one of our top performing students academically. In fact, she finished in the top five of her class every single term of Leadership Lab, including getting a perfect grade in term two, the term on virtue. The student was a peer leader throughout the program, taking on many responsibilities within the cohort, including an informal role of being the source of inspiration for many in those dark days of the MBA. The student excelled in all aspects of ALUSB's MBA amidst a big life change, the departure from her corporate job to a startup with a big vision to create value in a virtuous, eco-friendly manner. Now heading up this international company in Lagos, she is bringing Africa closer to a green future. Somehow, the student did all of this while still being a wife and a mother. But if you ask her, she didn't do it in spite of being a wife and a mother, she did it because she's a wife and a mother. In fact, it is her daughter who inspires her to do much of what she does every day, and her daughter is actually here today. One thing her daughter inspired her to do during the program, along with everything else that she was doing, her daughter inspired her to mark her 30th birthday with a 30 for 30 project that provided free STEM education to 30 underprivileged girls in Nigeria, giving them the opportunity that she wished her daughter and all young women could have. This student is a student who makes all of us at ALUSB proud, and she truly embodies virtue, value, and vision. She is the winner of the V3 award, and it is Tolulokpe Owokade. Congratulations, Tolu. Well deserved. To present the second award, I would like to welcome Chidi Afulezi, a member of our Entrepreneurship and Innovation Faculty. Good morning, everyone. Um, so it was raining outside. And it was actually thunderous when we were walking in. And it reminded me of my own graduation from business school 15 years ago. <laughs> um, and the message that we got was that that is about blessing, right? 
It's a downpour of blessings upon the celebrants for today, the class of 2019, the MBA class of 2019. Um, it is also a downpour of expectations, all right? So that's why I ordered this rain for you guys today. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Jumia and I was like, okay, two hours, give us 15% discount, right? Um, the class of 2019, the MBA class of 2019 is a very cl a special cl uh, class to me. Squad. Uh, we went through the uh, uh, entrepreneurship and innovation program together. And um, I saw the evolution of individuals who thought they would be corporate beasts for the rest of their lives. And actually people who thought of themselves as entrepreneurs, whether they would do it themselves or as entrepreneurs inside of their companies. And um, it is my pleasure to announce that the squad, we will be launching a line of products coming out of our entrepreneurship class. Uh, we would have a squad athletic gear, uh, squad lotion, squad toothpaste, squad socks, right? And their personal, their favorite and, and just, this is gonna blow your mind, it is a special brand of squad premium liquor, right? Because uh, they don't really drink that much. Before I give this award, I, I wanted to share something with um, the squad and everybody in this room. Uh, it's a fable from the Indian Cherokee uh, group in, the, in America. And it's about managing your thoughts, feelings, and actions. An old Cherokee is teaching his grandson about life. He says to him, a fight is going on inside of me. It is, it's a terrible fight, and it's between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride superiority, and ego. He continued, the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside you, and it's going on inside every other person too. So the grandson looks at him, kind of thinks about this, and says, Grandfather, which wolf will win? And the old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. This is my message to my squad. It's my message to everyone. Live a good life, and you will create these, what is it, 1,300? Oh, this is ENI, uh, 2,000 each. <laughs> I'm raising the stakes. Okay. The individual who's winning this award is someone who's very special to me. Uh, she doesn't know it, <laughs> but we had a conversation when I first met the group. We actually were in the bus and we had a really cool conversation about our families, about her family, about, you know, just the experience. And we, we truly had a bonding, a bonding moment. Uh, she is somebody when I think of these wolves fighting inside her, I see the good wolf doing a really good job of kind of taking precedence. So, as Ryan and I said, our silent killer, right? I'd like to bring up to the stage our Cameroonian sister, Helen Array. Congrats to Helen and Tolu, the power woman of the African century. Yeah. 
Today is all about you, MBA class of 2019. We celebrate your sheer tenacity, your exemplary performance, and your commitment that has brought you thus far. Representing the students, it is now my pleasure to, to welcome the class speaker of the MBA class of 2019, a Pan-Africanist in every sense. He was born in Lusaka, Zambia. He graduated high school in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and he has worked in Liberia and South Africa. This afternoon, he will walk away with an MBA from the AOU School of Business in Kigali, Rwanda. He is a business consultant and a technologist who is currently playing a catalytic role in driving industrialization and job creation in Zambia. Please join me in welcoming Mulumba Watula with a warm round of applause. Is there enough bass in this? Honorable Eugene Mutimura, other ministers present, Fred Swanika, Dr. Donald Kabaruka, faculty and staff, fellow classmates, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my single most honor and privilege to stand before you today as a proud member of the graduating class of 2019 and soon to be alumni of Africa's most innovative organization, according to Fast Company. When we began this journey 20 months ago, then Dean Modupe told us and welcomed us in some very sage words, don't waste my time. <laughs> now, when you hear words like that from a tall, cool and calm, 260 pounds of swag, West Point graduate, you sit up and take notice. No matter how challenging the journey over the last 20 months was, little did we know how gratifying life-changing, and full of growth it would be. 20 months ago, we all dared to do hard things for Africa's future by taking the chance to be part of Africa's history and the three million African leaders by 2035 challenge that Fred and the Africa Leadership Group had dared to set. Nearly 12 years ago, I sat in the audience as a fellow at TED Global Africa in Arusha, Tanzania, and listened to Fred share his dream of a peaceful and prosperous Africa by developing change agents for the continent. In 2010, at an ALN event in Santon, I sat in the audience as Archie spoke of this powerful business network that he and Fred had set up to encourage intra-African trade, investment, and collaboration. In many ways, this moment today connects the dots and brings my deep love for Africa full circle. I stand before you today to challenge myself, my classmates, alumni, and future African leaders to carry the mantle forward and build the Africa we have always dreamed of. An Africa that creates jobs, adds value to its natural resource wealth, and builds businesses that solve for the challenges that we face on the continent. Now, it has been said that in Africa, an ALUSB MBA student is raised by the community. And that certainly rang true for us throughout this MBA journey. From the late night phone calls to classmates and accountability partners, to our group chat debates and commentary, especially during leadership lab webinars, to our adventures exploring the beautiful city of Kigali and making any space that we took over come alive, we came into this program as strangers, but now live as a well-knit family and community. We say thank you to our families, friends, co-workers, and others who had to listen to us complain about being drowned in assignments and missing life events because we had PCAB, LL, HLT and PAG meetings and all other assignments due. We're pretty sure that all sounded Wakandan to you. 
But thank you nonetheless for standing by us and supporting our dreams. A special thank you has to go to Professor Catherine Duggan. For igniting an eternal flame in us to do more for this continent than we have or will ever receive from it, and to identify ourselves as the leaders who are crazy enough to, do, to change this great continent's fortunes as women and men in the arena and not on the sidelines. We will never forget the lifelong lessons we learned here, and we carry them forward knowing that it is in us to make a beautiful Africa rise. To my classmates that I am proud to represent before you today, I say go forth and make all your dreams a reality because you never know what you will inspire in others, the level of impact it will have on the lives of millions, and the dots you will provide and connect for countless lives. I would like to echo the words of the late Kwame Nkrumah, who once said, the task ahead is great indeed, and heavy is the responsibility. And yet, it is a noble and glorious challenge, a challenge which calls for the courage to dream, the courage to believe, the courage to dare, the courage to do, the courage to envision, the courage to fight, the courage to work, and the courage to achieve, to achieve the highest excellencies and the fullest greatness of man. Dare we ask for more in life. As I end my speech today, I implore all of you to have the resilience and the courage to do hard things for Africa's century, for there's no greater calling, no responsibility than this. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mulumba, for representing so well the MBA class of 2019. As we build Africa's MBA at the ALU School of Business, a key part of our ethos is to share the powerful lessons and imbibe the wisdom of the giants who have gone before us. It is a real honor for us today that our keynote speaker is none other than Dr. Donald Kabaruka an African giant and a dear friend of the African Leadership Group. Dr. Donald Kabaruka is chairman and managing partner of Southbridge, a pan-African financial services firm for private and public clients. From 20, 2005 to 2015, he was the president of the African Development Bank, during which time he bolstered the franchise value of the bank and tripled its capital to 100 billion United States dollars. Prior to this, he served as Minister of Finance and Economic Planning in Rwanda for eight years, playing a key role in the post-genocide stabilization of the Rwandan economy. Dr. Kabaruka also serves on the Board of Trustees of the World Economic Forum, the Mandela Institute, and the Moore Ibrahim Foundation, and he is the chair of the ALU Global Advisory Council. He is an embodiment for us of outstanding African business leadership, and we are honored to have him as our keynote speaker for today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a resounding welcome to Dr. Donald Kabaruka. Good morning. As you can see, I'm not uh, Hakim De Losage. <laughs> it just happens that Hakim is a good friend of mine. Actually, his brother was a college mate of mine. So when I was recruited only yesterday <laughs> by Fred, uh, helped by Richard Mugisha here, and Fosin Bundu, I had no choice but to, to be here. But serious, I'm pleased nonetheless uh, to be with you, congratulations. To you, the alumni, to your families, to the faculty, well done. Now, I've spoken to this class before, so that was another incentive for me to come here. And so I thought, instead of coming here and tell you nice things, 
I'm going to give you yet another lecture as you live. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about three things. The first thing I want to talk to you about is the landscape in which you are moving into. And I want to look at it from the perspective of the last 10 years and the last 30 years. Believe me, I will not be long. But I want to end that by coming to what Fred said, because yesterday him and I discussed this. Yes, you do hard things. But I said to Fred, that is a writer whose name I cannot recall, who has made a distinction between hard things, complicated things, and complex things. And I think you are walking into a world where you'll have to do all the three. And I'll come to that near the end of my conversation. So let me talk about the last 10 years. I don't know, is this thing visible? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. What I'm sharing with you there is the story of Africa as told by a distinguished public publication called The Economist. Just see what I have said about Africa over the last 10 years. They begin off by saying we're a hopeless continent. Is that right? In the year 2000. Then they move on, Africa rising. They move on about uh, $1 billion opportunity. I discussed that with you last time. And only last week, they came up with a story about a new scramble for Africa and why Africans can win this time. And I want to reflect on such a changing story in only 10 years, what it says about this continent. But let me jump straight ahead. And uh, ah, this side works. So here I join Fred in telling you why perhaps this publication talks about the scramble for Africa. That is the reason. You can take a look at this figure later, Africa today, and what will be in a couple of years' time. But I want to spend some time on this, and this is what I'm talking about the last 10 years. The last 10 years has been truly cataclysmic in world history. So what I want to share with you there is the story of 2008, when the global economy almost came to what I like to call a near-death experience. A near-death experience, and I mean it. I was the president of the African Development Bank at the time. I recall there's a, a time I passed three nights without sleeping because we were managing billions of money of uh, of Africans and our shareholders, and we have to look after it. However, people came together. Enemies came in the same room. I was privileged to attend almost all the G20 summit, including the first one in London, where enemies came together in the same room, were in the G20, of course, not very representative, and they took measures which saved uh, the world. And I'm using the word saved the world seriously. So what was initially a banking crisis, then became a financial crisis, and then economic crisis, these people made sure it never became a social political crisis. This is only 10 years ago. Now, fast forward, in 2015, the same people now joining the rest of the world did something even better the Sustainable Development Goals, Agreement on Climate, and Agreement on Financing for Development. An agreement which some people have referred to it as perhaps the most important year since 1945, building a new global architecture of how we want to live on this planet. That was 2015. Then we come to 2016. That is the last slide there. This famous uh, German philosopher, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Friedrich Nietzsche. Is that how to pronounce it? The one who said, I do my philosophy with a hammer. I don't have time to go through why I said that. It was about questioning the values of every age, every, every time. 
But truly in 2016, somebody turned up with a hammer. And he happened to be the president of the United States. Now, not him as an individual, but supported by many people unhappy with the globalization as it is today. Questioning every institution, the United Nations, WTO, even sometimes even NATO. Questioning all the institutions which have been placed since 1945. And as a result, today, we're in a world where the institutions we have relied upon since 1945 are all in question, because people are unhappy with globalization, either because they believe that the benefits have not been shared, or the pains have not been well managed uh, up in front. They're in the form of Brexit, they're in the form of uh, trade wars, they're in the form of questioning the Paris Climate Agreement, all forms. This is the world you're moving into. This is the real world you're moving into. And that is the reality of the last 10 years. From a, a global financial crisis, where people work together to contain it, to the great ambitions of 2015, now to 2016, which we're still living with today. Who knows where the world is going in 2020? How will the United Nations be functioning? How will the world function without multilateral agreements? And to show you how this is serious, for the first time in the last 30 years, and that is my next story, for the last 30 years, the prospects for global economic growth are very somber. Whether it is the Eurozone, Germany just escaped a recession. Uh, most of the European countries are just struggling. Because for the last 30 years, what has driven the global economy has been China and the emerging markets. These are the countries which have carried along the dynamism of economic growth. But China this year, we see the slowest growth in 10 years. 6.3%. Now, that is it, very big. Many people would be very envious of 6.3%. But it's from 6.6, 6.3. Still big, given the compounding effects. But it's the slowest in 10 years. Global trade uh, in 2018 began off growing reasonably. But this year, the growth in global trade is almost nil, zero. Not because of the trade wars, which I think will be contained, but I think because of a combination of factors which we don't have time to go into. That is the real world in which we are moving into. But how is Africa doing? Because I heard you, Fred, talk about how great we are doing. I'm showing you there uh, Africa's top economies. I don't know if this thing is visible. Those are the top economies in Africa. Uh, I just picked 10, I think. Part of the problem we're having is that some of those economies are not doing very well. They are performing suboptimal for reasons which I don't have to, time to go into. And as a result, you'll often hear figures of Africa's growth is 3.2. Actually, Rwanda here is growing at 8.2%. So there are many countries in Africa doing actually much better than the rest of the world. And my expectations is that they'll continue. But those top engines have to pick up. Those top engines are Nigeria, South Africa, Angola, and a few others who have been performing just about sometimes below population. But once those economies pick up, I'm confident that this continent can weather this downturn in the world economy. Now, having said that, Again, back to my 30 years. But I want to tell you something else which you should see there. That in the last 30 years, for the first time in the history of humanity, poverty has fallen from what was then, about 30% to below 10%. Again, because of what has happened in China, India, and many major markets. The number of poor people have gone from 1.9 billion people in uh, 1990, to just about 750 uh, million people, and never happened in the global history. However, 
and that is the second reality you need to look into. Economic growth does not always translate into well-being or necessarily into transformation. And that map, which I'll share with you, shows you those countries which have managed to convert economic growth into well-being for their people. In some countries, economies have grown, but that has not translated into well-being. And the reason is, again, without going into details, typically, if an economy grows by about, say, 2%, you would expect to translate them to 1% improvement in livelihood of people. In many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we do less than 1%. So 2% growth, but your translation into well-being is about 0.7%. There are a few countries there uh, who actually are managing to translate economic growth into prosperity. Rwanda is one of them. It's very small on the map there. It's not visible. But you can see places like Namibia, Cape Verde, and a few others. You can look at this map later. But just look at the one who has done miracles on translating economic growth into well-being, and that is the darkest there. It is China. So that is the other reality we're walking into. A lot of progress has been made, but we have two challenges. That is one. Creating all these great companies, how do you translate into uh, well-being for people? And here is something I want to share with you. I can leave you this map. I mentioned that the number of poor people has gone from 1.9 billion to about 750 million. But what that chart shows you that most of those 750 million are in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the locus of poverty will have shifted from South Asia to Sub-Saharan Africa. And that is another reality you're walking in. However, I'm teasing you with that. Uh, you can take it the way you want it. We have issues with data, which uh, you'll have to interpret. But I want to leave you that thought, that the last 10 years, you have had these tectonic shifts. And then the last 30 years, you have had this emerging picture. And that is the reality you're walking into. 1.9 billion people to 750 million, but most of them in Africa, about 420 million. So which means basically, as the World Bank report said a couple of months ago, there will be now, today as we speak, the highest number of poor people is in India and South Asia. So in the coming few years, by 2030 thereabouts, there will be many more poor people in places like Nigeria, in Sub-Saharan Africa, than South Asia, by the acts of demography law. So those are the realities you're walking into. And why this is important, and then I will end uh, my long story. Go back to Fred and the hard things. Doing hard things is very important. And what you have learned here, the skills you have acquired, will enable you to do hard things. But the hard things require what? That you work smart, you work harder as you have done. But then there are complicated things. Complicated things, if you want to drive a submarine or a create a jumbo, it's complicated, but you can learn it. It may take time, it may take time, but it's complicated, but you can do it. But there are things which I mentioned to Fred, this is what I call them complex things. Complex things, no one will teach you how to handle them. No one knows how to handle them. There's no book, no publication. There's no course about how you handle complex things. And I mentioned Fred, an example of a complex thing is bringing up a young child. Every baby is different. The fact that Richard came before uh, uh, Mary, those skills might give you a bit of a hint, but every child will be different. You have to learn as you go. You have to be very patient. You have to be resilient. You make a huge number of mistakes, because that is the nature of the beast. It is complex. So I want to end you end with this thought that the world you are going into 
we require that you work hard, you do hard things, that you resolve complicated problems, but that you keep learning until the day you go back to your make about how to handle complex things. That's what all of us are doing. And my association with ALU, uh, with Fred, was that his concept was that you are going to be taught how to keep learning all your life. Look, the economics I learned when I was at school, a lot of it now is completely irrelevant. If anybody had told me there's something called quantitative easing, I would have thought he was crazy. That is, you bring down interest to zero, negative, to stimulate an economy. We never thought that was possible. But because there was a complex problem called the global economic crisis, people figured out how to handle it. Now, for example, uh, those tools are no longer available. Interest at zero, at negative, places like Japan, places like Europe. They have money to uh, help on the unemployment side. The fiscal tools are limited because of debt. So now, to handle the current slowdown in the global economy, people will have to think again about how to, uh, to handle that. And in that story, I believe that Africa will be a player and you will be major players. So I want to congratulate you, uh, your families, uh, the faculty. Wish you well for what you have done and I hope that the ideas I've just shared with you can be helpful in some ways. Congratulations once again and thank you for welcoming me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Donald Kabaruka. Graduates, the challenge has been set. You need to do hard things. You need to do complex things. You need to do complicated things. Following those inspirational words, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to move to our degree awarding ceremony. This is the moment that these students have worked towards for the last 20 months. It is my pleasure to call upon Dr. Modupe Taylor Pierce to announce and present the candidates for the degrees. May I also ask Dr. Fred Swanaker and Vice Dean Professor Catherine Duggan to join Dr. Taylor Pierce at the front of the podium. And may I ask the first row of graduates to take your positions. Mr. Vice-Chancellor, on behalf of the Academic Senate of the African Leadership University, I have the honor to present the following candidates for the degree of Master of Business Administration. From Malawi, Agnes Kanjala. From Ghana, Ekua Nyame Mensa. From Zimbabwe, Alois Manglenkosi Mabuto.
from Burundi, Arno Nyongabo. From Botswana, Bame Morimong. <laughs> From Mauritius. Bibi Shahin Nuri Karimbokus. <laughs> From Tanzania, Catherine Rose. Josephine Barreto. <laughs> From Rwanda, Kajineri Mugenzi Christian. From Rwanda, Gakwaya Rubaduka Christian. Again from Rwanda, Cleva Mugabo. From Ghana, Daniel Kwafo Jifwa. <laughs> From South Africa, Danny Tong. <laughs> From Zimbabwe, Deborah Magwada. From Kenya, Mukonyi Mabia Duncan. <laughs> From Zimbabwe, 
Edwin Munyaratsi Tambara. From South Africa, Fortunate Matsidiso Serokolo. From Rwanda, Grace Mugabikazi. <laughs> From Malawi, Hector Chilimani. <laughs> From Cameroon, Helen Ako Are. From Nigeria, Ikena Ozochuku Nakodo. From Zimbabwe, Kuziva Huni. From South Africa, Dick Lady Tebello Mfutlane. From Cameroon, Luc Benjamin Guy Joy Paul. From South Africa, Lutando Christopher Vuba. From South Africa, Sakile Madera Untunua.
Also from South Africa, Manla Jacques Matonzi. From Nigeria, Manji Cheto. From South Africa, Matabiso Joyce Tamane. From Rwanda, Maria Nalumansi Mayanja. From South Africa, Mukwatsi Josiah Mkalala. From Zambia, Mulumba Mweshi Luatula. From Rwanda, Kubito Manzi Bakuramutsa. From Tanzania, Noel Latiaeli Mbise. From Tanzania, Nuhu Daniel Masai. From Zimbabwe, Patience Mapeza.
Indeed, this is the African Leadership University. From Zimbabwe, Philip Tapera Kuvawoga. From Kenya, Richard Indiga. <laughs> From Nigeria, Rotimi Bola Ojilade. <laughs> From Zimbabwe, Ruvimbo Chikwava. From South Africa, Sawela Brenda Kobola. From Zimbabwe, Sidumiso Dalia Sibanda. From South Africa, Stembeso Joshua Chabalala. From Zimbabwe, Terence Chambati. From Nigeria, Tolulope Olabinta Owukade. From Malawi, Ursula Banda.
from Rwanda Ive Msabimana Iradukunda From Zimbabwe, Zanudin Makore. And graduating in absentia from South Africa, Sibongile Bongi Mbelu. I will now like to welcome the Vice Chancellor of the African Leadership University, Professor Jeffrey Rujeje, to confer the degree. Master of Business Administration. Will all the candidates please stand? By virtue of the authority vested in me by the ALU Academic Senate and the Higher Education Council of Rwanda, I'm pleased to bestow upon you the degree of Master of Business Administration. Congratulations, class of 2019. Thank you. May we rise to celebrate the MBA class of 2019. A huge round of applause. Now take our seats. Congratulations, squad. There's going to be lots of time after to congratulate each other. Well done for this 20-month journey. Thank you again to the families, the friends, and the colleagues who have given them the support to get them past this finish line. It has been no mean feat. I would now like to welcome our special guest, Dr. Eugene Mutimura. Minister of Education of the Republic of Rwanda. Can we give him a round of applause? Uh, CEO and founder, Alo Fred Swanika. Uh, Honorable cabinet members who are present, keynote speaker, Dr. Donat Kaveruka, Vice Chancellor, Alo Inchigari, Academic Senate, faculty and staff, graduates and families, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I have the pleasure and the privilege in the first place to give my remarks after exciting moments and the joyous celebration that we are witnessing across the African countries. We in Rwanda take the pride in the educational system that we offer, specifically that we are witnessing today by the African Leadership University that we are celebrating this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, education and skill development is a key pillar for Rwanda, but also for other African countries. Indeed, we believe that this will shape our country's vision to be transformed into the next generation. 
specifically, uh, tertiary education opens up a lot of opportunities for us. Indeed, as we are talking with Fred in a moment, we are hearing a number of graduates today having several opportunities as they celebrate today. It is a therefore exciting moment to see us moving forward in a very fashionable way. We believe this is an important priority to educate and acquire skills for our youth, for our leaders of tomorrow. Rwanda has invested in education, and we believe that education transformation is a key facet to transform all sectors of our national development. We are very confident that the education and the skills we have acquired for the last two years will play a vital role to tra tra transform your lives, the people you will lead, but the global countries where you will practice at large. This is an exciting moment, but very challenging, certainly. But the African Leadership Universal School of Business mission to educate a Pan-African card of business leaders who will lead and catalyze various changes in the African continent is being witnessed today. And that is of paramount importance to Rwanda, but for all African countries. Its presence in Rwanda is witnessed in very many efforts that the country has moved forward. Let me mention a few. The University of Rwanda has several efforts, particularly to move forward science and technology. We have, for instance, data science. We have renewable energy. We have Internet of Things and several other ecosystems that support innovation in Rwanda and Africa, such as Carnegie Mellon Africa University, the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences, the East African Institute of Fundamental Research, only to mention a few. We have no doubt that the African Leadership University, with its innovative teaching and learning research approach, is being recognized by several organizations and will certainly add a lot of value and contribute to this research, educational, and private sector ecosystem. Dear graduates, as we joyfully celebrate your achievements of successful completion of MBA studies, allow me to take this opportunity to inform you that, indeed, as Fred Swanika mentioned, there are a lot of challenges lying ahead of you and lying ahead of Africa's needs to be transformed to greater heights. Indeed, Dr. Kaviroka also indicated that we are living in a global world that ever changes, and we are all faced by various economic and leadership challenges. But there is one thing I can mention. We are very uh, certain that you have been prepared very well as the MBA class of 2019 to address these challenges, and we believe that you will be able to address these challenges with several other leaders and various leadership in your countries to success. And therefore, I have a lot of hopes in you. As His Excellency Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda, stated in the inaugural graduation of ALU MBA 20, 2018 class, I quote, many of you will be putting your MBA to, to use on a continent that is better off than it has ever been and changing rapidly, end of quote. Each of you, as a business leader of tomorrow, has the opportunity and honor to serve Africa in its ambitious and several needs in order to be a prosperous continent in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude my remarks, I'm very privileged again to be part of uh, this afternoon celebrations, and we highly commend the progress made by African Leadership Business School in Rwanda so far, and we express our gratitude to founders, the faculty, the staff, 
the students, and all those who lead this university to greater heights. And I'm certain that the faculty, the families and friends of MBA program have been part of these efforts to make it successful. The government of Rwanda and specifically the Minister of Education and other partners shall remain committed to support and provide all the necessary support required to the growth of African Leadership University. Let me end my remarks again by congratulating you, your families, your friends, and specifically the African Leadership MBA class of 2019. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, and thank you for partnering with us as we work to transform education in Rwanda and on the continent. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our graduation ceremony. Graduates, as of today, you have 5,769 days before Africa has the largest workforce in the world. You have been challenged to do hard things, to do complex things, to do complicated things. You have been challenged to build the African century that is going to drive the prosperity of the world. MBA class of 2019, congratulations, felicitations, and thank you very much to all our guests for joining us today. The MBA class of 2019 and the faculty will now proceed through the center aisle for photos. We request that all guests kindly remain in your positions as the <coughs> academic procession exits the building. May I now ask that we stand and receive the graduates, the freshly minted, with Master of Business Administration, the MBA Class of 2019 of the ALU School of Business. Shall we give them a round of applause as they exit the building? Leadership University MBA graduation 2019. Please join us now outside in the foyer for a reception and our ushers will guide you accordingly. Thank you very much for joining us this morning.